uh, introducing yourself and letting us know about the Communist Party of Kenya, um, the main theoretical aspects, the main uh, struggles that the Communist Party of Kenya is involved in right now. You can start by with an introduction. Yeah, thank you very much, comrade. Um, um, my name is Buka Ngesa Omole. I am the national uh, vice chairperson of the Communist Party of Kenya. And I also double up as the national organizing secretary and uh, a member of the central committee. Um, what I would like to tell our listener that the Communist Party of Kenya is a product of the struggle. And um, uh, many poor Kenyans and workers have mattered to fight for this democratic space uh, to organize politically. And just to help you put it in history, we were only able to call ourselves Communist Party three years ago. Uh, uh, and that is uh, after a long struggle. So we could not say that uh, the current uh, Communist Party of Kenya is, um, is uh, you know, it's the only organizations that have started to advance the struggle of the Kenyan masses. But we are only uh, continuing with a struggle that has been going for many years. Uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, up to until 1997, communism was uh, banned in our country. It was, uh, you know, it was seditious. There were seditious laws that um, uh, banned communism. And at that time, the progressives uh, had to do most of the work covertly. And um, it's, it was only until 1997 that the progressive joined the Social Democratic Party at that time, because the Social Democratic Party was a legal entity, while any communist um, organization was targeted by either you know, the new colonial government here at home and of course their, their sponsors abroad. So we had the first liberation, we call it the first liberation when the progressives of this country uh, led to the introduction of multi-party democracy. And then after that, then uh, we had one long-term dictator that ruled us for 27 years and that was uh, Dictator Moe. Mm -hmm. So we managed to kick him out in 2002. And then the process of constitutional review started. And this went until 2010 that we had a constitutional review. It's only after that constitutional review that uh, you know, we could then organize overtly. So um, we can see that the Communist Party of Kenya um, participated in the elections uh, cov uh, you know, covertly under the Social Democratic Party for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was only until um, 2017, 2019, that the Central Committee made a decision that we will change the name to reflect on our political ideology because we are a Marxist-Leninist party. We are not a reform party. Mm -hmm. And um, even though it was legally acceptable to start off that, but even the Kenyan state, you know, rejected that proposal through the registrar of political parties here. And we had to, again, start the struggle to be allowed to be accepted as the Communist Party of Kenya. And that was a cocktail of array of struggles. We did uh, street demonstrations and finally ended up in the tribunal. And that is how we got to change our name. But but for the last 10 years, the Social Democratic Party at that time was purely a Marxist-Leninist party. Only by name, it was Social Democratic Party of Kenya. Mm -hmm. But in terms of our ideological clarity, in terms of our struggles as a people, we are a Marxist-Leninist um, party. Now, in terms of other ideological um, shades that I could probably talk about that um, converge at the, uh, the Marxist-Leninist ideology, uh, we are an internationalist organization. So we are in solidarity with the many struggles of the world. We, are, we call ourselves the headquarters of the international solidarity here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. 
and we're in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Palestine that are against the, you know, the Zionist regime mm -hmm. in Israel, the apartheid Israel regime. We are in solidarity with the last colony in Africa, Western Sahara. We are in solidarity with our, the heroic people of Cuba. We are in solidarity with the heroic people of Venezuela. And everywhere that, uh, you know, the, we are in solidarity with the people of West Papua. And um, we, every time we make our voices known to that uh, they got friends uh, in this part of the continent and we continue to highlight their issues. And also we could say that we are a Pan-Africanist organization. And even though we say that we are Pan-Africanist organization, we see Pan-Africanism as the objective, the software that actually runs Pan-Africanism in scientific uh, socialism, mm -hmm. which is based on Marxist-Leninist. And the entire belief, and uh, you know, we continue to rededicate ourselves that the, uh, for a continental unity that we, we want uh, not, not a united Africa like Europe, but a united Africa under scientific socialism. We want a united Africa and um, not build on racism, but built on dignity and humanity of a people. So um, in, in terms of our ideological uh, uh, clarity, that's, that's what I could uh, let you know. And um, of, of course, we have joined many struggles globally and also here at home. Excellent. And I'm really interested in what you mentioned of being a, an international solidarity organization and specifically interested in uh, Marxist-Leninism that incorporates Pan-Africanism into it. I'm curious what you think of the problems of neocolonialism in Kenya in particular, but across Africa as a whole. What does the Communist Party of Kenya view as the main threat of neocolonialism today in Kenya? Uh, and if you want to talk about especially the current government under Kenyatta, what is the, the main threat of neocolonialism? Yeah, in Kenya, we are being dominated by a neocolonial uh, turbo capitalist system here. It basically means that in our independence, we did not fight for our full independence. We reneg we negotiated for independence and the negotiation took place between uh, the nationalists and the imperial Britain. Mm -hmm. And um, when that negotiation took place in the Manchester conference, there was a negotiation. And the, the peace and movement that is uh, prominently known as the Mau Mau, uh, in Kenya here, we know them as the land defense force. Mm -hmm were not able to negotiate with the British, the Imperial British, because uh, for them, it was an issue of land. So if you don't give us land, then we have no business to talk about you. But the nationalists that was led by Jomo Kenyatta, who was the father of the current president that we have, uh, Mr. Kenyatta, the young Kenyatta we have now, uh, they were able to negotiate with the Imperial Britain because they had land their, their circumstance, their material circumstances allowed them to do that negotiation and sell out the, the fight for liberation. Mm -hmm. And they signed several pacts to safeguard uh, the, the Imperial Britain here and their allies. So in that case, we say we had a sham independence. When we talk of a neocolonial uh, capitalist system in Kenya, we mean that, you know, even the people in leadership in this country, they are so weak to completely oppress the Kenyan people. So they have to form uh, alliances of oppressions of the West and, uh, and our former uh, you know, colonizer, Britain, to be able to further their oppression and exploitation for the Kenyan people. Mm -hmm. So they are actually brokers of, um, of uh, imperial interest. They are brokers of uh, Western interest. They, if, if you look at the way they have turned our economy, it's upside down. They embrace um, uh, financial and physical policies that are proposed to them by the Britain institutions like World Bank and IMF. Mm -hmm. So you realize that uh, in 1990s to date, Kenya's economy was turned upside down. We are not internally looking. So you realize that we are reduced into a low, you know, uh, a, a low, 
uh, wage earners people and then we export raw materials that are being you know creating jobs elsewhere mm -hmm. uh, so in that way we we see that we are only a market for second hand clothes for second hand everything if you look at our cars on the road the clothes we are putting on we are not manufacturing anything we are not geared towards any industrialization uh, what we see in the current leadership is um, uh, there, there are a few people which we may term as the national uh, bourgeoisie, but the country has been taken by the comprado because they are only in uh, a negotiating approach with the, the, their big bosses in Europe, their big bosses in, in, in the United States of America. And when Kenya, I, I think last election, if you study a bit of what happened was that the, the, the national uh, 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 tribal elites were fighting in this country. And the people who were leading that negotiation was Godek here, who, is the, who was the um, ambassador of the United States to Kenya. And they're not leading such negotiations to try and, uh, you know, uh, raise, uh, 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 like put up a, a sustainable peace in our country, but to take care of uh, certain imperialist interests, which is uh, mainly in extractive sector, we have a gold plots here, we have uh, titanium based resources, we have um, even flower, uh, flower companies here, which uh, are, um, if you look at, for example, the Dutch flower farms in, um, in Naivasha, they are using difficult chemicals, they are not paying people minimum wages, they are, um, uh, it's, it's, it's what I will call a modern day slavery. In, in actual sense. And um, they are given this um, uh, license to operate in our country without certain rules because they are in a very toxic marriage to suffocate our people with the, with the national leadership. So um, uh, the duty of the Communist Party of Kenya is first is to destroy the illusions that the capitalist system in our country has created to divide us among tribe against tribe, uh, you know, ethnic against ethnicity, and bring out the class contradictions that are inherent in any the turbo capitalist system, and then consolidate the workers, consolidate the poor people and the peasants in the political force, and also to tell them that without the political power, they will never be able to attain economic ends because the many non-governmental organizations that are actually Western uh, oriented are camping in our country. And they're telling people that you can start some enterprise to, uh, you know, to make money. You can, um, you can start some small business of selling, um, of selling some small stuff like uh, grains. And then from somehow you can be a millionaire or a billionaire. So in, in actual sense, they are taking people out of reality, but the circle of poverty still continues. So the, 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 the biggest task of the Communist Party is to advocate for political literacy, bring the people's, um, uh, bring the masses back to reality. Because mm -hmm. in our own analysis, the objective factors of the revolutions are at, you know, at the highest level possible. So we just need to deal with the subjective factors of the revolution to make people, to build genuine cadres, to build a strong, kind, a strong party anchored on the people and to be able uh, you know, to inspire hope among the hopeless people that are in our country and tell them that uh, they can trust in our cause and this is the cause for the majority of the people. Um, a few years ago when Barack Obama was the president, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, I, could sell, I, I could call it emotions around the mm -hmm. black communities, and even here in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, even though the Communist Party had already held a, 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 even a much stronger position that Barack Obama can only act as a black face on the imperialist interests. And that's what we see here. When he came here, he still continued with the George Bush policies. And um, there was one particular one that was called the AGOA program where they were, were implementing the economic, uh, economic processing zone. And they were lying to the Kenyan people that Barack Obama was much concerned about employment of the young people in our country. But the economic processing zones are exploitation centers. The Kenyan masses go there to work for nothing 
And then they have been able to negotiate for the American uh, multinationals and European multinationals uh, to get subsidized water, subsidized electricity, and such kind of things. But at the end of the day, they suck all the foreign exchange from our country. They suck all the cheap labor from our country. And then after that, collect those um, secondhand items overseas. We popularly call them here as Mutumba to come back and sell them to us as second class things. So, uh, well, I think the history is on, on our side that people can see that uh, the consistency of the Communist Party of Kenya in terms of trying to expose a certain um, uh, international uh, uh, you know, crime, uh, I could call it crime syndicates between mm -hmm. the, the, Kenyan, uh, the, the, the Kenyan government uh, now. Mm -hmm. But if I'm to look at the foreign policy, this has been really bad for our country. In fact, mm -hmm. for some reason, we have performed so badly in terms of foreign policy that when Mr. Kenyatta came to power, he did a few things and um, we thought he, he overdid himself in terms of foreign policy because our foreign policy as a country, especially the foreign policy of government has been wait and see. Remember, Kenya was not very instrumental in terms of fighting the apartheid regime in South Africa. They were not right. instrumental. In fact, uh, Kenya was being used as a gas station to fuel um, uh, bombers that were attacking Uganda. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, at least um, in the last 10 years, after the president Uru Kenyatta and his deputy was indicted by an imperialist court, ICC, they decided uh, that to, you know, to overcome that indictment by the, uh, what they saw as the United States and British uh, interference uh, you know, on their ambition to become the leaders in our country. So you realize that they, they turned to the East you know, and started to, to talk about you know, the ills of the, the United States foreign policy in Africa, but it was only a leap service. They never did mean it. By the time they were out of the hooks of the ICC, in fact, for a, for a moment, uh, the government of the day embraced the Communist Party of Kenya in 20, 2016, 2017, uh, and some years before that, because we were talking about international uh, uh, at the ICC as an imperialist court. Mm -hmm. So opportunistically, they supported our struggles, right. but it was only going to last for you know, for a long, for a short time. Mm -hmm. We have seen uh, the policy. Uh, now we have the Palestinian embassy here, but the if if you look at the previous governments, even whether they are in opposition or in or in government, they still go to pick arms in um, uh, uh, from the the apartheid regime in Israel and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and that is what their loyalties form. And, and, and it, so uh, what I'm trying to put to you that uh, uh, the, the, the regime that continues to, do, to dominate us here in our country has no single interest about the, the, the majority of the people. Probably you've read about the Pandora Papers where mm -hmm. the, the, the Kenyan political leaders are stealing money and then they stash them away in, um, in European banks, um, what they call tax havens. Mm -hmm. And they try to, uh, you know, to convince the local people that we can make wealth here while they don't, they don't even have confidence in the economies that they are running. So they are taking their money away just in case, you know, they are um, overthrown, which is inevitable that they will be overthrown. Mm -hmm. So they can have, uh, you know, a safe flight and enjoy their loot elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So when the, uh, the countries of the West lectures about fighting corruption, and they don't talk about the ill-gotten wealth for the African political leaders that are being stashed abroad. It is very hypocritical in our lenses because if they were serious about fighting corruption in Africa, uh, uh, having not to say that the British introduced corruption, the British multinationals uh, started corrupting our government officials immediately after independence to try and win tenders and, and you know, and compete among themselves. Uh, to us, we think that uh, we can only fight certain ills like corruption, poverty, based on uh, you know, a political uh, revolution, uh, a political revolution that is able to bring dignity to our people will only when the state, the instruments of the state actually is understood not to be neutral, but we inspired to then work uh, for the majority of the people.
uh, not for the insignificant minority. Very, no, very well put. And I'm interested in something you touched on and, and kind of want to bring more into the conversation about the opportunistic appeals to anti-imperialist rhetoric that weren't actually sincere. I'm wondering about the perspective from the Communist Party of Kenya on national liberation struggle, on anti-imperialist struggle, and how to make that a more genuine commitment as part of a, a communist struggle. How does that apply to nations like Kenya that are still fighting to liberate themselves from their place within the extractive position within the the uh, underdeveloped world. Yeah, Joseph, what we need to understand is that the national liberation struggles were really not a monolithic struggle. They involved certain stratas in the African continent that had, um, you know, different ends. Um, not all of them uh, were looking for that after we kick out the colonial uh, government, uh, then we will be, we will liberate our people. In fact, the majority of the nationalists that were non-progressive, they were envious of the white man's position. So they wanted to take those positions and continue to dominate their people. And if you look at um, the negotiations that took place towards independence, the nationalists that were, the backward nationalists were able to negotiate themselves for positions and land issues and even plan jobs within the government to advance. But in, in, in other areas, in fact, we like to give these examples when we are uh, teaching our people here, that there are countries that after, especially the Asian countries, uh, particularly even China, if we are to talk about it, mm -hmm. that after the Japanese imperialism um, you know, was defeated there, the, 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 colonial, the, uh, the, the colonial power was defeated, but they pursued an independent internal path to develop their economies. But uh, this idea of opportunistic relations were during the struggle for uh, national liberation, it's not a new thing. Because if you look uh, back, you will realize that we used to have the so-called um, non-aligned forces. The non-aligned was, um, you know, was an opportunist uh, uh, line when uh, they wanted to benefit from the USSR, then we are neutral on issues. When we want to get some arms from the United States, then we are neutral on those issues. Mm -hmm. But um, they did not bother to, to analyze the stratas because uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the struggle for independence, you could see that um, there were various uh, formations. One of the formations were the nationalist progressives. Then we had the nationalist, um, you know, retrogressives, and then we had the masses that were, bare, were always uninformed, and to them, they fought for material fight. But to them, if they did not have land, they want land. If they did not have grain, they wanted grain. So they fought a fight for survival. Mm -hmm. But um, you realize that after the negotiations, there was... Um, uh, high level assassinations of the freedom fighters, especially those that held positions that they will want to advance those paths towards socialism. Mm -hmm. in, in our country, uh, we had a few, they did not come out as communists really, but they were very progressive nationalists. We had Bildad Kagia, we had uh, uh, the father of the head of opposition now, he was called Jaramogio Ginga Odinga, Mm -hmm. and many other people. So since they were not able to negotiate with the colonial uh, uh, imperial Britain, you realize that the people that were in jail, uh, maybe their material conditions were much toughened, so they were willing to negotiate with the colonizers then, and then sell out other you know, uh, brothers and sisters who were fighting for, the, for them in the same struggle. In Kenya, the British tried to make Jaramogi the president, but he refused that, uh, you know, they needed to release uh, Jomo Kenyatta from prison to lead the, you know, to lead the independent Kenya. But finally, at the end of it, when they negotiated with Jomo, the progressives were crushed. Some of them were jailed and, and, and killed. In fact, before the coming of independence, the leader of the National Defense, the, the, the Land Defense Force, 
uh, Field Marshal, uh, you know, Dedan Kimathi was hanged in prison. So they were trying to clear any evidence that could probably, you know, inspire the poor people to advance the fight for total liberation. If you look at even in South Africa, after the negotiations were done with, uh, you know, now um, uh, the, the, the late Mandela, we don't blame Mandela for much because um, of the price he paid for the freedom of his, of, of his people. But look at the Marxists and the communists that were assassinated. Uh, look at uh, Oliver Tambo, look at mm-hmm. Joe Slogo, look at, um, uh, you know, Ruth Fast is being bombed in, um, in Mozambique. So the people who held good positions that was to advance the struggle of the ordinary people were either assassinated, alienated, or jailed. And, 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 and people like um, Kwame Nkrumah for a fact was overthrown uh, in, in, in few days. But also if you look at the philosophical debates that um, were taking place at that time, is that you realize that the, the European thinkers were very racist in terms of their approach towards Africa. So even the African thinkers that see a lot of science in terms of the Marxism and Leninism, it took them quite a bit of time to prepare themselves to advance their knowledge, to deepen their knowledge mm-hmm. of what Marxist-Leninism as a scientific theory is. Because remember, Kwame Nkrumah came up with some, uh, uh, you know, conscientism. And um, why I was talking about such, those shades? And uh, it's because every time he read about uh, books on Hegel, he read about books on, you know, on progressive uh, European mm-hmm. thinkers, then he came to the conclusion that they were very Eurocentric. Yeah. So he decided he will want, they were looking for something that is more Afrocentric. Mm-hmm. And um, you, you, you realize Mualim um, Julius Nyerere, as is referred to the founder of Tanzania, even started African socialism. So the debate of African socialism started as a, a, you know, uh, as a way to conform uh, to the public opinion at that time that um, the, the racist approach of the European thinkers was not implementable, that Marxist-Leninism was, was an alien ideology, and now we needed to, um, to do a homegrown you know, ideology to feed the, the African continent. So it was only a few years later that uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah absorbed themselves. I think when they wrote a book, uh, The Class Struggle in Africa, mm-hmm. now we had thinkers like Amilcar Cabral, that were, you know, had a bit of clarity in terms of class struggle. Uh, now, in that aspect, then we, we could say that that debate ended in Africa. Now, nobody talks about African socialism. We, we, we take a very strong position that as long as something has been declared scientific, then its implementation could vary from, uh, you know, various circumstances and material realities that are facing us in each and every society but we could not talk about issues to do with African socialism or uh, European socialism or American socialism, but we talk about one universal uh, scientific socialism implemented, uh, you know, within the realities of a people uh, like Kenya. So we hope that we could be able to advance. For example, Kenya, we are still talking about the National Democratic Revolution. The Communist Party of Kenya is trying to form alliances to defeat the, you know, the dictatorship of the rich people here, even before we start our construction towards uh, socialism and communism. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And just from knowing some history about the South African Communist Party, it's a very similar kind of struggle and a focus on the national democratic aspect of the revolution. Still, I'm curious about applying that to the modern day, uh, what the Communist Party of Kenya views, uh, before I move on to the next question, just a a last note on that, but what uh, aspects of, whether it's delinking or whether it's um, an approach targeted at the extractive position within uh, the world system, but how can national liberation uh, today still play a role in a communist struggle, particularly in the in the, in the underdeveloped world. Yeah, pro- what we need to know that the, uh, the dangers that are facing communist movement are more or less unchanged. 
since the 18th century and now in the 19th and the 21st century, um, such, dangers, such dangers remain alive. And um, we should be very careful when we are forming alliances with any liberation outfits or any progressive ideas. And the Communist Party of Kenya is well aware of that. And um, some of the dangers that are facing communist uh, parties um, all along, uh, you know, across the globe, uh, uh, sadly, some of those problems even led to the, to the fall of the USSR. And um, we have seen even in other socialist experiments uh, deteriorating uh, the processes. And one of them is opportunism. Uh, once that is something that we, we continue to, to, to deal with in the party quite clearly. Uh, the, the second one is revisionism, because if you try to revise Marxism, you know, to fit positions of privileges of a few people, then we are, uh, you know, diluting the doctrine of the liberation of the masses and trying to accommodate the parasites within the movement. So uh, such things are what we are careful to, but we also know that our revolution is not going to be a straight line. We have uh, each and every stage, we have to see, we have to isolate the people's enemy and try to fortify, you know, uh, our, our mass base and inspire anger to, to the enemy at that time. For example, during the fight for independence, it was easier for the nationalists, it was easier for the Comprado and the, the, even the national bourgeoisie to cooperate together. Even now, sometimes we join certain campaigns about the national bourgeoisie because they're saying, you know, buy Kenya, build Kenya. In that way, we see that when, when they start off that rhetoric and they're trying to encourage, you know, um, uh, local industrialists to advance, you know, to, to be able to create a market for them there, we see it as important to us, other than the people who just want to auction the county to the, you know, to the biggest buyers. So the most important thing is be wary about revisionism, be wary about opportunism, and then form deliberate alliances to advance the struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, now, uh, somebody could be wondering why is a Marxist-Leninist uh, party participating in a bourgeois election? It's like competing with money, and we don't have money to, to try and run such, certain processes. Mm -hmm. But we have to bring clarity that um, when the masses are with the, you know, with the bourgeois democracy, that is where the masses are. And we do not want to be isolated from the masses. So when there is an election and the political environment is, is heightened, we must never leave the masses at the mercy of, um, you know, the capitalist politicians. We must seize the moment to do our propaganda and agitation to, to try and raise the class consciousness of the masses. And even though our chances of, uh, of performing or of, of winning power through bourgeois elections are very slim, but at least it helps us to, uh, you know, to continue our preparation for the subjective factors of our revolution. Uh, and also secondly, is that we are um, normally very disadvantaged in terms of the media coverage. And, and even though they do it sometimes, uh, either if we don't force them, then they will want to only uh, highlight the main uh, capitalist political parties. In fact, there's a dangerous, dangerous rhetoric in our country that we have been able to defeat that the Kenyan and the people of Africa only need two or three political parties like in Britain and in the United States right. to try and you know, lead a dictatorship of a few capitalist political parties like we see in the United States, Republican and Democrats, you know, dominating the United States people and lying to them about certain things. And, uh, you know, but everything else, they tell you such a such a person is a lesser evil to the other, you please, uh, you know, carry out an electoral process. Mm -hmm. and, and that was also what the NGOs wanted to import to our country. At least for a moment, we are able to defeat such propaganda and bring reality to the people. So, mm -hmm. In terms of the national liberation movement, those are uh, liberation movements that are formed for a particular purpose. Right. And then we have to realize that when we are going to those uh, liberation movements, what is it that we are going to achieve? From the Communist Party of Kenya, we see movements that we work with here have clarity of what we want to achieve. For example, 
the Communist Party of Kenya works with the landless, the movement of the landless. Mm -hmm. And when we go there, we are fighting for land. So we don't care for from which class strata do you come from. But the unity at that point is, are you fighting for the land of the landless? Then at that time, we are united. When we are talking about things like anti-privatization, there are progressive elements of the of businessmen that see it that like of a privatization of um, of uh, of common goods like ports and um, and land is uh, is not a good thing for uh, the stability of their country. They might be doing it for their own selfish interests, but at that moment, the Communist Party of Kenya will want to advance an anti-privatization campaign. So we form temporary unities. Um, as long as it is clear for us, if you look at our program in the Communist Party of Kenya, we are very clear. We have a short-term program. Um, uh, we have a minimum program. And we have the maximum program. Mm -hmm. our, our, our minimum program is to continue to defend this democratic space that our brothers and sisters have fought for. We must never allow any, um, uh, any, any, any of the things that we fought with to be taken away from us. Mm -hmm. We defend the 2010 constitution with our life because we know that one, if it's gone, then we don't want to go back to, uh, you know, to do underground politics because right. it is much more difficult there. Then we have our minimum program, which is to take political power by consolidating the structures of the working class into a political instrument and finally taking the political power and the minimum and then the maximum program we will want to start our construction of the new state not the bourgeoisie states after the the taking over the power we want to declare you know the minimum program and start to lead a dictatorship of the of the working class to try and uh, uh, you know get the wealth from the people who stole it and um, and, and start off the the, the reconstruction of our country. We also will want to get in touch and unify the, our struggles, both um, at Pan-African level, which is continental, and also at the global level, because um, we are much aware that capitalism is global. So if in any way we will want to replace capitalism, then we have to replace a global thing with a global thing. And that is why we talk about international, uh, international, uh, international uh, globalization uh, based on friendship, uh, solidarity, and scientific socialism to counter the neoliberal, uh, you know, globalization that is being championed by the United States and their Western allies. Very, that was very well put, and uh, I think. It's very interesting that you picked up on um, the aspects of the national liberation struggle that a lot of uh, people in the West do not kind of focus on, um, particularly uh, a focus on breaking away from the international globalist capitalist system uh, and trying to assert a position separate from that. That brings me into kind of our next question. Um, a lot of us are curious in the West, especially those of us who are Marxist-Leninist ourselves about the view from uh, the underdeveloped world on, on China and increased Chinese investment in Kenya and across the African continent. So I'd be interested to give you some time to, to talk about that and the CPK's position on that. Yeah, um, first of all, we got to get clarity that we have the global South and the global North. Mm -hmm. And for, for CPK, we were inspired by uh, several speeches of Hugo Chavez in, in, in terms of handling that equation of the global South and the global North. Mm -hmm. The people of Africa are safer when we have a multipolar world mm -hmm. and not a unipolar world because it gives them strength in terms of negotiating for continental interest against the big powers who have continued to dominate. Right. So that multipolar world could be imperialist powers, it could be socialist powers that be, but it already gives us a lifeline as the global right. South. It's important for us to, to note that. The, the, the second thing is um, 
the United States hegemony, you know, relies on blackmail of um, of um, other, you know, other countries, other nations to try and isolate them. And they don't care which project they are doing, whether that project is um, for the good of their, their citizens, like in Cuba, or that project is for good for of, of, of a few people. But as long as um, that experiment that is being done in that country is not in tandem with what they call the United States interests, then they declare you an enemy and then they do sanctions and then they do financial blockades. And then after that, they start their war games by calling, you know, whatever, you are a dictator, we, you, you want to dominate your people. And then after the sanctions and the financial blockades, you know, start to suffocate your people with, 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 with hunger, you know, like we saw in Zimbabwe, we saw in Venezuela, in Cuba, then they started to, you know, to, to bring in money through USAID and other non-governmental organizations to try and finance some right-wing terrorist organizations like you can see Islamic states. And they, before you know, they are raining bombs on you because they have continued to win public opinion. They have continued to win the global public opinion that, you know, Buka is a terrorist. So it's a case of, you know, uh, call the victims the terrorists and then bomb them into subjugation and then from there you can advance your hegemony in the world. So if we are to look at it from that perspective, then the Communist Party of Kenya takes a clear, a clear stance that we are in favor of a multipolar world. So even if Russia is an upcoming power or any other, um, uh, we saw the BRICS uh, um, at that time, I think it was um, India, it was Brazil. They were trying to form an alternative, uh, you know, financial um, infrastructure of the globe. And the Communist Party of Kenya is aware that if that succeeds, then some of our worries will have been settled. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, the Chinese um, uh, revolution and the Chinese experiment, first of all, that revolution is very close in our heart as the people of um, of Africa, because we share a lot of similarities with the, the heroic people of China. The heroic people of China fought against Japanese imperialism. Right? They fought against colonialism. Uh, they were able to advance the economy in, you know, in, um, in very, uh, in, in, in amazing way to bring people out of poverty. So we see a lot of similarity between the Chinese revolution led by Chairman Mao and, um, and, and, the, and the African uh, continent. Sometimes we do clear comparisons between India uh, that took a neoliberal path and the Chinese, uh, the heroic people of China that took a different path. Uh, we, we, we look at Vietnam, we look at Laos, we, we, we try to compare them and, and see what we can learn from them. After saying that, the, the, the condition of China is rather too complicated. And we could not say that from the Communist Party of Kenya, we are a specialist. But we know that we cannot criticize China in a very cynical and in a racist way like the West wants us to do, because they made us think like, you know, the Chinese goods are, um, you know, they are substandard before even arriving in our country. They made us uh, think that the Chinese people are racist even before we met them you know, before we started to interact with them, with the Chinese people. And, uh, and, and now there is a global campaign, uh, you know, to sing war drums for China. There is a global campaign, even in my country, there are NGOs that um, are laundering American taxpayers' money to try and, um, and, uh, and, and, and spread anti-Chinese propaganda. Um, and, and we know that even before they started spreading anti-Chinese propaganda, they still say China is successful because it is capitalist and communism is, uh, you know, is a failure everywhere. So if communism succeeds, then there is nothing it can do. It can only be capitalist. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that we can criticize as progressives within the Chinese socialist experiment, because we call it an experiment, because even the Chinese themselves have not said they are, they are a communist state. Or, or, or a communist country. They are saying they are working towards communism by the year 2050. Right. But we see um, when IMF and World Bank were triangulating us, they were killing us in Africa. 
nobody was there to give us an alternative to negotiate for um, you know receptive votes. The 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 Western NGOs uh, that were uh, organizing uh, you know offensive in our country were in deep marriage with the IMF and World Bank, and they made us. Uh, what uh, now we are even experiencing austerity measures in terms of fuel. They made us to close our industries and that silly campaign of less, you know, uh, 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 more business, less government led to a lot of retrenchment. So uh, we don't see any, any sympathy from the West or we don't want to take their advice on how we should relate to our brothers and sisters in China. We, we, will want to, we will want to appreciate that the coming of China or Chinese capital in Africa has seen tremendous uh, you know, uh, improvement in terms of uh, African relations with the West. At least now when President Obama came in in our country, he was able to negotiate with our president. We have seen the arrogance of the ambassadors of the West reducing in our country because they know China is a competing power. So China has given us a, you know, a leave to negotiate in terms of loans. And we have also been keen to study things that are happening in, in China. They, they, they tell us, they try to, to play some propaganda videos about um, human rights you know, issues to do with China. They try to bring issues of Taiwan. They try to bring issues, um, you know, the, the, the pro-democracy protests that are taking place there. But in our country, we know that we are not even living in a, a democracy. We are living in a dictatorship of uh, you know, an insignificant uh, rich people. We know our brothers and sisters in the United States are living in capitalist dictatorship. It is not that they, they are enjoying democracy. And in terms of human rights violation, uh, what if we start to have debates about Guant Guantanamo Bay? What about if we have debates about the United States coming to our country to influence, to influence anti-terrorist acts and bills, to bribe our members of parliament to pass certain bills, to be able to kill people that they don't like, um, particularly uh, the, 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 the Islam, the, the Muslim clerics, um, the, the communists that are organizing, they are arrested and um, you know, are jailed uh, on Trump up charges and are shipped in body bags to the United States. Um, they are not telling us that. So the United States and their Western allies that colonized us here have no moral ground to lecture us about how we are going to relate with our Chinese brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So we see the, the historical experience of the CPC as, um, as something really to learn from. Even with their own weaknesses, we have seen that the Chinese people if we are to call them an imperialist power, it will be the most reactionary thing. Because mm. if you look at our loan book in Africa, even though the Western multinationals and the media, uh, you know, I call them the lie factories, the BBC, the <laughs> CNN, uh -huh. that are meant to brainwash the African people, even though they are saying that we are taking a lot of loans to, from, from China. But if you look at the Kenyan loan book, the Paris Club is giving us loans, IMF is giving us loans, World Bank is giving us loans with conditionalities. And the Chinese, um, uh, our, our loan book in, in terms of the Chinese was very, in fact, it was not even 25% the last time we were having these debates. So we, we don't want to run scared uh, with, um, with the illusions about um, Chinese imperialism. In fact, imperial, imperialism as we know it, first of all, they just don't dominate a people. They right. finance, uh, you know, um, uh, a people to they finance war. They dominate um, uh, a, a people through oppressive and repressive force. And and Chinese have been very clear. In fact, we would have liked the CPC to support the Communist Party of Kenya. We are yet to have a relationship with them, but they have a policy of non-interference. They do not want to interfere with uh, the internal affairs of the Kenyan people. Right. But we don't take it, uh, you know, as offensive to our organization. We know that when the Communist Party of China were organizing their revolution, the USSR financed both the CPC and also they were having a, 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 you know, a relationship with the government of the day in China at that time. 
and we we don't we don't want to to hold the, the CPC because international solidarity is not an act of charity. It is not uh, uh, something that we demand from the people. It is we we also don't need anybody to empathize or to sympathize with our with our situation here. If the best thing that the people in the United States or the people in the in Europe can help us to do is that they can hold their governments responsible, that they should uh, be able to put more pressure for their government to stop spending money, you know, uh, in, 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 in financing war, in bombs, and financing, you know, a military complex. So it cannot, they cannot provide food, they cannot provide uh, education, they could not provide quality healthcare for their people. Now, if that pressure is there from home, that will be good, good for us in Africa because then we will be, uh, we will be free to organize um, our, own, um, our own affairs without yeah. undue interference or limited interference from the, the, the Western governments. So uh, we continue to pursue knowledge. We continue to humble ourselves to understand the, the situations in China but we would like to be critical about the Chinese people based on knowledge, not, not based on propaganda influence and anti-Chinese propaganda being spread, mainly by you know, the media factories uh, that uh, operate in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was incredibly well put. I'm, I'm curious about, uh, on that note of the propaganda that has come from the West about the rise of China, um, I, I think the answer may be uh, somewhat obvious, but I, I'm curious about your perspective about why the U.S. And, the U.S. in particular, but the West in general, seem so terrified of the rise of China and fear it, and thus have to propaganda propagandize against it uh, to such a high degree. Uh, what does the the rise of a multipolar world, in your opinion, uh, you talked about negotiations, but uh, in particular, thinking about the defense policy of the United States as it pertains to using Kenya as a base for military operations, how do you see uh, the rise of China in a multipolar world threatening that uh, American and Western hegemony in, in Kenya? Uh, what I would say that the United States um, want to be a big boy, so they do not want to accept anyone who want to pursue they don't have, they don't care about right to self-determination of a people. Mm -hmm. And one thing that scares them, you know, to hell is any successful story about socialism because they have published all sorts of, um, you know, nonsense, all sorts of propaganda against any socialist experiment that has ever been carried out. And um, to them, uh, getting people of, um, of, of poverty is not a priority to them. They have continued to dominate this uh, continent, they have continued to dominate the world affairs based on, you know, I could say, raw lies and illusions. Mm -hmm. And um, they want to continue to brainwash the people of uh, the United States to continue to scare them that um, they are taking care of their security interest, while we know that they, they are not taking care of the security interest of the United States uh, people. In fact, they are setting the people of the United States against the rest of the world. They are spreading hatred um, you know, for the people that are actually loving and are determined to advance in life. So any successful story has, uh, of, of socialism is a scare. You know? uh, I, I think you understand the, the red scare. It was uh, oh, quite sure, something yeah. in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, even if you go back, uh, Cuba has made uh, tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, progress in terms of biotechnology, in terms of medicine, mm -hmm. in terms of creating of a new human being who, you know, who respects his, um, uh, his neighbors, who respect, uh, you know, others regardless of where they come from. They have made the tremendous mm -hmm. process in terms of handling issues to do with racism. Mm -hmm. And China has also advanced, uh, uh, you know, a lot in terms of um, development. In, in, in mm -hmm. fact, um, uh, there is no reason now they, they have run out of lines because if you're talking about uh, Chinese technology coming to our country, now everybody's looking for China because um, uh, people believe their quality. Uh, even me who previously worked in the engineering uh, sector, we see Chinese technology as an alternative and they are open to negotiations in terms of technology transfer. 
In the United States and the marginals, if you talk about technology transfer to your people, they will tell you keep the job. So there is um, a lot of um, uh, concerns on uh, the rising of China. And, um, and, and, and I think it scares them because they cannot, they cannot see themselves um, having all these um, you know, embassies that they have built becoming museums in the next few years. <laughs> They cannot uh, uh, see themselves being able to blackmail anyone because in Kenya, for example, where they used to walk in and blackmail anyone, it has been difficult for them because uh, if you cannot give us this, uh, we will talk to our brothers and, and you know and sisters in China and see if they can be able to give us a better deal than you. So you try and be a good person and we can try to, to work with you. But, and also, I think um, the American poli foreign policy, and this you could be much more knowledgeable uh, about it than me, but from where we sit, we see the American foreign uh, policy is to try and uh, also condition, you know, to brainwash the American masses completely to buy on their propaganda, to buy on their rhetoric. And um, in that way, they will be able to dominate that country for a very long time before any uprising comes about. They have been hiding against the, you know, the, 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 the black eruptions that has been with the United States for a long time. They have been doing crackdowns on the organizations that are doing um, communist, communist con conversing. They have been trying to infiltrate our education system to put mm -hmm. anti-communist propaganda. We have many evangelicals, um, extreme evangelicals from the United States that are opening big churches in our country. Mm -hmm. They are opening universities. Some of those things that they teach in the departments of philosophy, they will never even uh, try to escape them in the syllabus in the euro. Because uh, mm -hmm. if you start a philosophy class by talking about how God created this world, then you can just be obviously a silly person because there is nothing that you can try to debate from that false assumption that we, we are not part of nature. So in, in many ways, their desperation to keep the American masses almost uh, you know, uh, inactive and try to, uh, uh, to dominate the rest of the world, they would like to put a, a, a puppet in China. They would like to put a puppet in Cuba. They would like to put a puppet in every other country. But uh, sometimes we pause and ask ourselves, where has there been success where the American government has had their puppets? You know, look at, um, uh, look at, for example, Venezuela before Hugo Chavez came to be. In as much as now they want us to believe that uh, Venezuela is the hell on earth, it, it basically is because they have um, continued to interfere with oil prices so that they don't get foreign currency. They continue to ban them to import even a little uh, you know, uh, technology to repair the equipments that they supplied for a fee. The Philips actually supplied these items for a fee. Why are they not supplying parts for it while the Venezuelan people paid for them? So. Um, we, we don't care about the United States um, uh, being scared about the China. What we want to do is we want to make this world a peaceful place to be. We want our brothers and sisters in the United States to know that they have people who love them unconditionally and will want to advance their struggle in a more honest way. And even the whole rhetoric around here is not against the United States of uh, people, but is against a government that is alienated, not just from their people, but a government that is being run by billionaires. Before you ask me about China, we've been receiving very good news how the Chinese now is dealing with the billionaire club. And they're not even allowing them an inch to power while the United States is being run by you know, lobby groups. Mm -hmm. People like Donald Trump may never make it to, you know, to power in, the, in, 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 in China. Mm -hmm. So, what we are trying to put across that the, the concerns about the United States are um, the concerns of a dying empire. Every empire who starts to finance war, who starts to inspire hatred, 
who does not consider the interest of their people and um, want to do a lot of investment in terms of brain, brainwashing and conditioning masses is an empire that is on its way down. And they should know that in the history of the modern world, we do, people just want to live in peace. People want to live in, you know, to live and sustain this world. We want to progress as humanity. We want to live in joy. In fact, we are not in the fight because we love to fight. No, we, we just want to live with dignity. We, we, we also like to dance and take some beer and celebrate our life in the best way we can. We, we are not dogs or animals who just want to fight. But now if we don't fight, then we will be selling an entire generation. Right. In incredibly well put. I think another interesting thing for me too is that uh, when you were discussing Venezuela and Cuba, the US level of propaganda, I think, uh, and, it, and it also applies to, to Kenya, uh, this need for interventionism, this need to meddle in the affairs of other countries. Um, one of the reasons I think for the US policy in East Africa and continuing to conduct war and have a US military presence in East Africa is this brainwashing of the US population to convince us that we have to be the world policemen, we have to conduct military for the, for the entire world and be involved in every other country's foreign affairs. And as we know, it's, it's all part of a, a policy of control uh, to ensure that the US military is really in control uh, in all of these countries and Venezuela, Cuba, China, I think, are great examples of countries that have been able to resist that. But that kind of brings me to a, another topic, which is knowing that that is the policy of the United States. We have many concerns, myself and, and other uh, American, you know, people who identify as communist, concerns of the more reform-minded uh, left opposition, whether they be social democratic, democratic socialist, who try to continue American foreign policy and don't and don't believe in anti-imperialism as a key part of their uh, socialism. Um, that's a concern for me. I, I'm particularly concerned about Western uh, left-wing parties that don't put anti-imperialist policy, non-interventionist policy, trying to destroy the American empire at the key part of their, their program. So I'm curious your view uh, from Kenya and also from the, the part of the world that is suffering from continued American imperial hegemony on those parties in the West, the more reform-minded parties that don't believe in fundamentally destroying the American empire and the Western uh, military hegemony and are in some ways complicit in maintaining it uh, and your view on those parties and whether they can ever truly be uh, true friends for the, the liberation struggle in the, in the third world. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned about the military bases mm -hmm. um, and we, we don't take it for granted that the United States of America and French uh, continue to have uh, heightened military operations in Africa. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, other than the military bases, they are even plugging our military system with their military system. So they are infiltrating our military infrastructure, our military, uh, you know, uh, we don't have a secret. Uh, we don't have a, a security secrets anymore because we have to consult mm -hmm. the United States. We have to consult the Mossad of Israel. We have to mm -hmm. consult the French. Mm -hmm. And we, in that note, we are happy what is happening in Western Africa. At least the Western Africa is rising against French imperialism. Mm -hmm. which has uh, taken mm -hmm. place there in a long time. In Africa, particularly in Kenya, um, it will shock you that the British still have a base in our country. They have right. uh, one of the biggest bases. In fact, uh, we even uh, now estimated that it, the number of the British soldiers we have on our country could be able to take over our country with very minimal uh, fight because we, 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 we offer them um, uh, at the Nanyuki Air Base uh, and they have been continuing to, oh, last year, they have only been able to inspire hatred and anger because of the, the silly things they have done in Nanyuki. 
and they have continued to conduct rape. They have continued to be reckless with the, their bomb experiments leading to the killing of the people. Uh, the United States of um, America also have the murder base here in Lamo, but um, they have their way in government. Uh, previously, before Mr. Kenyatta came to power, we had another president called Kibaki, and um, he was very categorical that the United States will not have a base here. But now they use these anti-terrorist um, laws and uh, blackmail to ensure that uh, sometimes they even donate some weapons to our our mm -hmm. our military mm -hmm. and in return um, um, they try to say we want to train you on anti-terrorist policies we will want to take care of your defense budget and in that way they end up to negotiate with the government today but uh, the communist party of kenya continue to highlight the dangers of such experiments and uh, how they compromise on our independence as a country mm -hmm. and why we should be able to overthrow the neocolonial government that continues to dominate us here at home to be able to start a people's process. So the Communist Party of Kenya takes a clear stand that we do not need any military uh, or war games in Africa. Um, in fact, the African as American experiment has been deeply rejected among the progressives. Uh, the second part, which is the most interesting that you've asked me, is the position of the left-wing political parties in Europe okay. or in the United States that are pro-reforms. And this is historical. If you look at the, the first uh, reform country that started, the reform party, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, and, um, and the differences that they had with the Luxembourg, the Rosa Luxembourg there, mm -hmm. the debates have not changed much. but uh, one clear thing that I would want to probably mention is that when the European powers or the great powers, when they were extracting a lot from their colonies, they had surplus to sustain the working class in their countries. So the working class in Europe had always had a quality life. They were highly cultured and they didn't see the striking disparities between the contradictions between the bourgeoisie and the working class in Europe. Their pay were okay. Their medical system was okay. So in that way, the, the, amount, of, uh, uh, the amount of theft that um, can take place in the former colonies has since reduced tremendously. And you can see that in, in France, you can see the level of riots and demonstration that is taking place in Paris at the moment, yeah. because they, they, they are used to certain life but they did not know that the, the, the amount of money, the amount of wealth that was being robbed from West Africa sustained that economy. And now the Macrons and the leaders of, 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 of the French government cannot sustain that quality life. So they, they are experiencing pressure from the working class. And the working class um, contradictions with the, the, the capitalists in that country are going to be even sharper in the coming days when the crisis in West Africa continues to grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that well, when we are talking about reforms and reform parties, it is a product of trying to revise Marxism. Mm -hmm. It's trying to tell us that we can coexist with the oppressor and the oppressed, mm -hmm. that we can coexist you know, as poor people and um, and rich people staying together without the poor having to kill the rich. That is basically what they are telling us. In fact, in Africa, it has even been vulgarized in, 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 in even the worst ways possible because they use prosperity gospel to tell the poor people in Africa that there is a paradise in heaven, that you will inherit it and the rich people have no future in heaven. So you can continue to suffer here on earth while you will enjoy an eternal peace in heaven. And, uh, and, 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 and that is um, the propaganda of metaphysics uh, that um, is anchored on the philosophy of idealism to try and pro promise people things that are only in their head that do not have extra mental reality. Mm -hmm. But having said that, the, the, the environment or the circumstances in which the Europeans are all the United States citizens are organizing 
are even much diverse and are different from ours. They are living with the oppressor in the same room. It's highly financed. In fact, the, the CIA always try to penetrate um, through, they try to penetrate progressive or revolutionary organization in Africa through another revolutionary organization in the United States. Right. So you remember they implement, they, impl they actually implant their intelligence among those so-called progressives. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I was reading um, uh, Ashata Shakur's book, it, I was, uh, it was intriguing how at one moment he was having a meeting that was meant to be a party meeting and 50% of the attendance of that meeting were actually CIA trained. So you can see how dangerous the progressives there are organizing. So they are facing um, um, uh, diverse challenges um, organizing at home. But the, the reform also, the reform agenda also needs to deal with the class character of, the, of where people are organizing. If you have, for example, in the Communist Party of Kenya, we are deliberate. We have taken a step under party policy that at no point our party will have less than 70% of the working class. Now, if then if you look at the leadership in the parties of the West and the United States, they are really from the petty bourgeoisie tendencies, mm -hmm. uh, from the intelligentsias, they are lecturers, they are students, mm -hmm. they do not face, they do not face the repression of the regime. So if you have certain, um, or, or certain people like that, then other than their theoretical knowledge about the class contradictions, they do not have a class experience about them. Mm -hmm. So to try and um, bring out a campaign, uh, you know, what every time we call in our party the rectification campaign, is to try and bring back reality into the party by recruiting more members from the working class and, the, and making sure that even in the party leadership, we have um, members of the working class that have nothing to, you know, to make a deal with the bourgeoisie because mm -hmm. to them it is a fight between life and death. So if I negotiate with them, the benefit of the capitalist depends on how much money he continues to take from me. So either I surrender and accept that I will be subjugate, subjugated for my entire generation or I should uh, fight uh, fast. So the big problem, if you have um, members of the intelligentsia or the petty bourgeoisie or the bourgeoisie leading a party of the proletariat or a party of the new type, they try to secure their positions of privileges. And they cannot imagine that after the revolution, those positions of the privileges will be non-existent. Mm -hmm. So they try to create positions of privileges for themselves where, while leading the proletariat party. Mm -hmm. Now, when they do that, they fall into the Marxist era and they fall into revisionism, and they try to take compromises with the leadership of the day. When they do that, then they start to lose the support of the working class because the working class tries now sees their, their, their error and start to call them sellouts because when, they, when such progressives, revisionist parties get into a relationship with the bourgeois political parties, they get um, goodies in return they get cars in return, they get houses in return. And if they are even incorporated in the government, they get uh, plum positions. And you can see that in South Africa, for example, we have a tripartite being led by South African Communist Party and, um, and as the vanguard, and we have ANC and we have COSAT, which is the workers. There is a lot of pressure from COSAT to sometimes to check the South African Communist Party. But the top leadership of the South African Communist Party of Kenya, some of them, South African um, um, Party, are in government. They, they are not in a hurry to effect the revolution. So they are in a comfort zone. So uh, a few years ago, we were saddened when um, there was a breakaway to form the Revolutionary Workers, uh, Revolutionary Socialist Workers Party in South Africa. But we can understand their frustration. Yeah. So uh, I think that um, in the countries of the West or the United States, uh, such organizations, progressive organizations, uh, and also parties should be deliberate about organizing uh, the members of the working class. Then they will see less opportunism. They will see less revisionism. And also to try and learn from history. 
Social democratic uh, organizations already sold out the working class. They supported the world wars, uh, you know, at, at one point. The, the, what they were calling the, if we talk about the second and a half and the second international that made Lenin start the third international was because the second and the second half international were supporting colonialism. They were supporting, you, you know, uh, imperialist wars. And in that way, they already sold the working class. And we know that the contradictions that are between the, the people who work and the people who take the proceeds of work, the capitalists and the workers, they are irreconcilable. Mm. To try and reconcile such a process is to, you know, to dominate, uh, to try and subjugate and dominate the poor workers. I, I can't agree more. I, I think uh, one of the biggest problems we face is that a lot of these reform-minded parties that do still exist are repeating the error of the Second International by supporting American uh, imperialist policy worldwide, supporting American propaganda, and sometimes even repeating it. So I think it's very frustrating to, to see that. Uh, and it leaves a lot of uh, communists who, who are in the, the West to think about what kind of organization, what kind of action we can do uh, to support the struggle in the third world as well, to commit to an anti-imperialist struggle as well as a communist struggle and not to play into uh, supporting uh, the enriched uh, labor aristocracy in the West at the expense of the, the working class and the proletariat of the third world. Um, it, it leads me to a question, I think, of uh, two, two fronts, I suppose. And the first is, uh, your horizon and your perspective on the future of, of communism across all of Africa and the, the potential for success and breakthrough, and also your perspective just generally in the globe itself and how uh, the struggle in the third world, particularly across the African continent, can play a, a, a great role in with that success, ultimately pushing and driving the rest of the world uh, and pushing revolution in the, the West as well. So. I'm curious about your perspective on that, the, the future of the movement in the African continent and how that affects uh, the revolutions across the world. Yeah, if I'm to think of the future, the future is based on reality. The future is not based on illusions. The future is not based on, uh, you know, it, it has to be based on truth, which is the congruence of what we think and what is in reality. Mm -hmm. So the question we can ask ourselves, is communist movement on reality or, or in illusions? Uh, are we on absurdity or we are on reality? I will say emphatically that the communist movements, especially those that sticks to the Marxist-Leninist school of thought, know that the future of mankind is scientific. Mm -hmm. So is the ideology that anchors neoliberalism, the ideology that anchors capitalism, where people you know, are left at the service of unseen market forces, are they anchored on reality? When people, uh, in fact, talk about the, you know, the powers um, that are given from above, are they, are they in reality? In my opinion, uh, of course, my informed opinion, is that the future of the communist movement is even much better because it is based on reality. It's based on science, it's based on truth. The second thing I will want to say is that if we look at during the USSR and the United States antagonism, communism was being brought to the people. The USSR was championing the the, the spread of communism. They were trying to integrate brotherhood and sisterhood on the people who were struggling. But even after the fall of the USSR or the socialist blocs, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, it was declared that communism has ended. In fact, there are two historical um, essays that I like to read. They are written by two different people but uh, talking about the same thing. One is uh, the fallen comrade, Joe Slovo. He wrote 
has socialism failed? And when he was writing that, Kim Il-sung in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea wrote again another similar one, attacks on socialism are intolerable. And um, you could see some congruence in those two documents. People have never met, but they are reflecting on the same future of socialism. So the question you've asked me, you know, has been with us from 1994, <laughs> from 1990s. And people have been asking, do we have a future of communism? So uh, we now, it's different because in the Communist Party of Kenya, we, have, we are working bare minimum. We don't have as, res as many resources. We, we are uh, organizing our struggles in some of the most extreme difficult conditions. But we are seeing people coming towards communism. We are not seeing people being persuaded because they know that if a communism is at the helm of the struggle, then it will not sell out. So we are winning the masses in that. If we are fighting for the landless, then we will not stop until the land is given. Right. If we are fighting for some judicial processes, we will not negotiate with the oppressor out of court. So we have continued to see that actually communism is attracting masses. Of course, we are also attracting hatred in similar mechanisms. Right. But the people who hate us, I think we don't have any much reason to care because the hate is actually mutual because we are organizing to overthrow them. So if they want to spread lies against us, if they want to set the public anger to against us, if they want to spread anti-communism propaganda, we just don't care because when, I, when communism reaches the masses, when they reaches the peasants, when they reaches the working class, then it becomes a true force. So in that way, then we see that the future of the, commun uh, the communist movement in Kenya, the future of the communist uh, movement of the globe, it, 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 it only has taken you know, a stride in history that in, at times there is progress and then at times there is retrogression. And retrogression is when we have leadership or political parties that want to take back the gains of communism. And we hope that that will not happen in China. We hope that that will not happen in Cuba. We hope that the struggle for um, liberation of Venezuela will continue. We hope that all communist parties across the globe will continue to educate themselves and have more knowledge in terms of penetrating true reality and then advancing um, their struggle. And the third thing that uh, is most important, because I think that does not just touch on communism uh, or communists, but it also touches as ordinary people. Because the whole world, in fact, the criticism of capitalism has since ended. Everybody is talking about what will replace global capitalism, what will replace it. So the most clear ideological uh, you know, school that has challenged capitalism and has had a few experiments done uh, is communism. So what is the alternative? I know the, uh, we have had some um, writings from the Pope talking about Catholic social thought, uh, which is also a bit of, um, you know, it's just a reform agenda. The Pope in his head want to reconcile the thieves and the, you know, the workers. He want to reconcile, um, you know, if I even use biblical terms, he, want to, he, he wants to reconcile evil and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like trying uh, like a child to mix water and fire and thinking that the end result will be fire water and it will be a good cocktail. No. So we, we, we have seen, and that is what the social democratic parties are doing. We have seen certain experiments in the Scandinavian countries about uh, mm. uh, welfareism, state welfareism, mm. but such experiments have not been able to eliminate exploitation and oppression by man on man. So the discussion on what to replace capitalism, what to replace imperialism is even heightened within the, the bourgeoisie themselves because to them, they are searching for solutions that allows them to have positions of privileges. So they will never find such a solutions within the bourgeoisie framework, within the capitalist framework, because they only see an alternative that can continue to dominate. And they have, 
they have taken a few experiments at the global level and they're running out of options. One of the experiments that they have taken, um, of course, is um, the corporates trying to put up a, what they call excess money into corporate social responsibility and trying to, to limit um, uprising and uh, the murder of those corporates in where they are doing their businesses. So that has also just been able to delay the revolution. They have continued, um, you know, to continue to preach, uh, to preach peace through evangelical and Christian movements to try and tell people that um, we can coexist peacefully in this God-given planet. But then you can only preach that so far. When, 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 when people are burying their loved one that have died of curable diseases, no amount of such delusions will prevent them from, from acting. And, 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 and also now the main experiments that uh, they have done in both Latin America and in Africa is the NGO experiments mm -hmm. and what they are calling the campaign on free enterprise. Mm -hmm. They are giving money you know, on loans to get more money from the poor people. And they are saying that in that way, we can delay the process of our overthrow. Mm -hmm. Such desperate attempts were done by the feudal lords such desperate um, attempts were done with the slave masters, but the inevit the, the, the inevit uh, what is inevitable is that communism shall win because we are anchored on, on, on truth. We are anchored on reality. We, we fight uh, and the only people that are willing to sacrifice uh, their, their life to sacrifice themselves for the entire struggle is on the communist side. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and that is not, the rich people are not willing to pay any price for their struggle. In fact, they want to move out their wealth. And if it is possible to buy some land in the moon or somewhere else that they can stay and still continue to extract, um, you know, the wealth of the people in the world, they want to do that. But the communists, uh, the revolutionaries are willing to pay the ultimate price. We are willing to matter fighting for, um, in fact, we say the only cause was sacrificing oneself is the, the, you know, the cause for the working class. And, and, and that to me guaranteed, guarantee our win and the future of the communist movement. Very, very well put. Um, just, I wanted to agree with something you said there about the, the problem of the Nordic experiments, the social democracy experiments that are so frequently touted in the, in the West as a great example of what socialism can look like. Uh, and as you, as you put it very well saying that they have not eliminated ex exploitation of man by man, they have not e eliminated exploitation of the first world by the third. Uh, so they're not really a model to, to look towards and try to emulate uh, within the, the rest of the West or within the rest of the world. I just have two, I guess, final questions. Um, my first is the if you can talk a little bit more about the CPK's efforts to organize for uh, communist parties across the African continent. So I'm thinking of uh, the CPK's involvement in the uh, the ALNEF, the Africa Left Networking Forum. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about that and kind of what that uh, poses as a potential way to create a new uh, supranational organization of communist parties across Africa. Yeah, I, I think on that, I would say that the communist tendency is that we will go to fight where the win is possible. Mm -hmm. And if the win is possible now in Sudan, the communists in, in Kenya will be in Sudan to fight in the war front with our brothers and sisters there. And taking that, that, um, that tendency in communism, we, we were convened by the South African Communist Party, which is the oldest, um, um, uh, Communist Party in the continent mm -hmm. under ALNEF. But in the greater part of the Eastern Africa, we have seen that the Communist Party of Kenya continue to build stronger relations with um, the Communist Party of Rwanda. Rwanda is a very unfortunate country, very unfortunate country, where a few people masqueraded as revolutionary and now they have jailed uh, revolutionaries, the true revolutionaries there. Mm -hmm. They have kicked them out. And in fact, the Rwandese Communist Party of Kenya is busy organizing in the refugee camp. 
and there is an illusion of peace on in a country that has many fronts of armed organizations. Um, it, Rwanda is the biggest jailer of communists of any, uh, you know, prisoners of conscience. So we 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 are in in um, in in sympathetic with the Rwandese people, but we continue to associate with the Communist Party of Rwanda in exile. In fact, in many ways, they were exiled here until um, the Kenyan state opened, um, um, uh, it gave uh, Kagame a license to kill the, the Hutu refugees, the, the Hutu political refugees in Nairobi. And now they moved to Congo and Kampala. So then we have the Communist Party of Congo that is uh, at least have a, a smaller liberated zone and they're continuing to advance their struggle there. So we are in good, uh, warm relationships with them and we, they are part of the ALNEF uh, uh, debate. Then we have the instruments, you know, uh, the, you've seen Mali, for example. Omar Mariko remains in jail, who was leading the left there. But at least uh, there has been coups and counter coups taking place there, organized both by progressives and reactionaries, which to us we see as an interesting, uh, an interesting, um, you know, occurrence to challenge the domination of the French imperialism there. But we are also working with it. We, you, you go back to Sudan. Sudan is the most successful story that we have ever related with it. For a long time, the Sudanese communists found refuge here in underground camps uh, for the communist, from the communist, uh, their communist brotherhood here in Kenya. But they were only able to advance their revolution, albeit even halfly in, the, in Sudan. But again, we've seen Riyadh and Israel coming in mm -hmm. to try and stop that revolution from, from, um, from being completed. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in Ethiopia, the communists, um, they, are the, they are only acting individually. We don't have a communist party in Ethiopia. Uh, the ruling party in um, Eritrea has communist tendencies, but we are happy with the peace that took place in, um, in Ethiopia with Eritrea. But also it was able to bring an interesting contradiction that if you continue to sustain peace through tribal or clan alliances, and trying to exchange leadership from one clan to the other, thinking that that would be stable, it is a big debacle in Ethiopia. So you go to Morocco, we have a few left-wing movements there fighting against you know, the Morocco king. Um, and most of them, especially are residents in Tindu where the people of Western Sahara are fighting against the colonization of their country by Morocco. It's a sad case that the United States sides with Morocco in such a process just because they will want to exploit sulfate and other mineral, uh, you know, from. Um, and it's the same case. It has a lot of similarities, comrade, if you look at it between the decolonization process of Western Sahara and how the British just gave the Israel the land of Palestine. And they're saying the, the, the one which they didn't have now. Well, you listen to the Morocco king and you, you feel just angry because he's saying the, the territory of the Western was given to them by the Spanish people who was a color, uh, you know, a, um, an occupier. So in that sense, we, 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 we relate with Polisario as a front for liberation in, in Africa. And um, uh, of course you have read and, and seen on um, various uh, media, the processes that are now taking place in Swaziland, the, the monarch in Africa, uh, and the Communist Party of Swaziland has been in the forefront in terms of uh, advancing that struggle against the, the, the monarch system in Swaziland. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the future of the left in Africa, first of all, the left in Africa is struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're always uh, underfunded. They cannot even, um, some of them cannot even organize in terms of Communist Party of Kenya, at least we will be able to, to push the struggle to certain ends because um, of, of um, uh, across sections of our population still belong to the working class. But if you have people that do not have any meaningful earning, even to contribute to the party becomes a problem because they cannot feed themselves. 
So you'll right. find that the left, uh, the left political parties in, in Africa are struggling. But our duty is to inspire them and tell them that they are on the right side of history. So they continue, they have to continue fighting. They, they, they cannot lose grounds because I, when I read books like um, um, uh, the books on Mau Mau from within and uh, see the situations that our freedom fighters were fighting for, they were so extreme. And, um, and, and we can not say that just because we, we have almost nothing we cannot continue to challenge the imperialist forces in Africa. Uh, at least we could learn that if we can continue to talk to the masses, to educate them, then there could be a chance that the left political movement in, um, in Africa will continue. Apparently in East Africa, we had a lot to learn from Julius Nyerere's socialist experiment. His um, party is still in power, but they have diluted the entire framework of that revolution. Uh, they have continued to do, uh, to implement neoliberal policies in Tanzania. Uh, uh, even after the late dictator died, the current uh, uh, president still continued to advance, um, you know, policies that are against organizing. And we still have so many comrades that are in jails in Zanzibar, that are in jail in, um, in Dar es Salaam. So um, in terms of organizing uh, as ALNEF, we take the Pan-Africanist stand that the total liberation of African people and African continent, wherever they found themselves can only be, we do not have a privilege to, uh, you know, not a privilege, but we do not want to or wish to colonize other people for our own good. Uh, so we can only lead a liberation for everyone, not for ourselves. So we can, if we, if we build uh, a continent under scientific socialism, then we advance a global arrangement under scientific socialism. Then contradictions in terms of racism, contradictions in terms of ethnicity, contradictions in terms of religious, are much tertiary as compared to the contradictions that uh, take place within the social, um, uh, pro the system of social production. Uh, a few hours ago, I was addressing a press conference here in Nairobi, and they were asking me, Buka, you have been fighting about against tribalism of setting one tribe against the other. What is the moral value of the class contradictions. Why are you setting the poor against the rich? Yeah. Uh, and and um, I was telling them that no, the disparities between um, tribes or disparities between ethnicities or racism are not based on any reality. In fact, they are based on illusions in people's head to try and dominate a people. But class contradictions is a reality. It is anchored on the social relations and you can see how the rich manipulate systems to, to continue to dominate. So to talk about the poor people having power for the first time do not actually amount to any immorality. The rich people have had it for 60, 70 years and we are not willing to let them have it only for domination because their power is for the insignificant minority. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the prospects of organizing the left in Africa, it's difficult. We, we, the, the main, the main um, source of uh, uh, funding for the party is being criminalized. Like for example, in Kenya, the Communist Party of Kenya cannot be uh, got any solidarity fund from anywhere else because mm -hmm. the government do not um, you know, want, to, want them to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the people, the kind of work that uh, people are involved in, they, they are mainly living in Nairobi. If you check the data now, 60% of Nairobi people live like animals in slum areas with no food, no running water. Uh, they are living with sick mothers and, and children in their houses. How will they even, how will you even have the morality to tell them to contribute money for um, the, the party. So mm -hmm. the best they probably will give you is drinking water and food when you're organizing in their areas. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will tell you that 
we have um, a difficult task ahead, but we are prepared for it. We we have the we have the power to to sustain the fortitude to to and the courage to to stay the course. Absolutely, and and you know we believe that as communists we do believe that it's inevitable, but there's so much to be done to push towards that. Uh, that inevitability is never uh, uh, truly inevitable unless there's a fight and a struggle uh, to get us as close as possible uh, across the world. So very appreciate um, your answer and appreciate your struggle. Our very last question that I wanted to talk to you about was something you had sent to me, something that I had seen uh, a lot on social media that actually was able to kind of um, break its way through to what a Western audience was uh, uh, an incredible video um, put out by the Communist Party of Kenya that showed how the CPK is using hip hop and music to connect to the youth of Kenya and to organize the youth. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that and how the CPK views this as a way to organize the youth, to get in touch with the youth of Kenya, and even why it's important to organize and, and talk to the youth. Yeah, there, there is a history to it, comrade. Uh, in fact, this struggle in Kenya has been always been sustained by songs. In fact, I was a young man. The only thing we knew was to, you know, wake up and sing in the name of the revolution and mention the people who have died before us and to remind ourselves that we will not hesitate to, you know, to sacrifice ourselves, to defend those gains that they have, you know, fought for. So mm -hmm. we have had songs, but it has been very difficult to produce them, to record them. Mm -hmm. So a few, two years ago, we started the album one and album two projects in which we did of voice recordings. And most of those songs are progressive songs that we have sung underground. We have sung them overground. We have sung them in our study circles, but they were in our oral library. They were not, uh, we, they were not written. So we started the process to document the struggle of the Kenyan people through songs two years ago. And we have um, done about 18 songs. We did them. Um, audios for that, which we recorded. But in the course of doing this, we were recruiting young people in the party. And the young people, you don't expect them to sing the same songs you sang, you know, when you're growing up. Uh -huh. So we have seen a lot of creativity from the Young Communist League. They are coming up with their song that resonates with their struggles. And, and hip hop has become, uh, you know, a big thing for uh, the Young Communist uh, League that are organizing. So sometimes they say that when they go to talk to people about struggles, it is a painful experience. But when they start to sing about it, when they start to rap about it, then the message is clearer to them. They, they, they end up the meetings in high morale. So um, a few months ago, we decided to do an experiment of doing, in a, uh, of doing uh, now starting to produce the songs that mm -hmm. they sing in the in their organizing. And we started it in the Western part of the country. And we tried to shoot a few with uh, with our mobile phones and mm -hmm. uh, try to see if we can inspire. The, the idea was if we can inspire the other people who are organizing in areas of the country to try and come with songs to advance our message among the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, but surprisingly, we got uh, a huge international following based mm -hmm. on uh, such a video. But uh, we hope that um, in fact, uh, that international audience has been able to inspire the young people in the party. And they're taking the tasks more seriously. They are taking the task to write the songs and they are hoping that even though uh, uh, they are still crippled in many ways, but they can produce um, a proper song because you can see that people have been asking, send us the real song, but we are trying uh -huh. to still put the songs together uh -huh. and, uh, and see if we can have uh, a professional to shoot the video and uh, drop it out before the, 
the launch. Um, we, we, we know that uh, we are going to have our campaigns mm -hmm. in August um, 9th, mm -hmm. and we have a real chance to, for the first time to win elections. Mm -hmm. We have won elections before, but on the lower houses. Um, right. In 2017, we won a few, but we know that we only win in the working class areas. We only win in mining areas. We only win in landless places. So we concentrate to do that. And it is important to us to win an election because it makes people like you also know that we exist. It, 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 it also helps us to get, to, to, to bring out certain contradictions that um, um, happen within the capitalist uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we hope that we could continue to do more songs. Mm -hmm. And um, I think songs are a product of the struggle. They, I see most young people, they write the lyrics on, their, on the move when they're organizing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, sometimes now I see even children writing them at the back of their exercise books and mm -hmm. trying to sing mm -hmm. along to them. So I think it is an, a, a great inspiration for the comrades that uh, have been in the party for a long time like me, and also the younger comrades find a voice and we allow them to express themselves their anger, their happiness in the best way they can. We do not want to, to them to learn by art like, like, um, like they want us to do, but we will want them to give them a frame of mind that they can think on their own, they can make proper judgment on their own, so long as it remains fidelity to the proletariat revolution. Excellent, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing more songs seeing it it was incredible to see it on social media and to see the international attention that it brought to the communist party of kenya and i think that helps to promote the message um especially to a western audience that uh in many ways as we've been talking about needs to see that the, the struggle is continuing in the global south and and in many ways is the most uh, effective and the most important that's happening in the global south so, and, and then as you said too, getting the youth, getting the youth organized, getting the youth inspired, uh, particularly using social media that many young people all over the world are, are connecting uh, through now, I think is an incredible way to continue the struggle. It's an incredible innovation that hopefully more parties throughout the world will, will pick up on and hopefully will provide a lot of success to the, the movement and the revolution in Kenya. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for taking the time to interview with me. Um, and just to let you know that uh, there's solidarity throughout the world for uh, the struggle and the, and the Communist Party in Kenya. Um, I'm available anytime uh, to continue to follow up with you, to continue monitoring uh, the movement. And, uh, and, and if, uh, in addition, if the CPK would like to contribute anything in writing or anything uh, ever uh, to our journal and what we're doing in, in the U.S., uh, there's always a desire for, for collaboration and solidarity. Um, but before, before closing out, I just want to ask if you have any, any last things to say and, and anything else you forgot to mention. No, no, no. We, we feel very warm to hear that there are, you know, people who believe that this struggle has a destiny, that uh, the struggle for the liberation of uh, mankind has to continue. Mm -hmm. So that makes our heart very warm. And uh, my encouragement to my brothers and sisters and my comrades in the United States is to tell them that the same way we are looking for our economy to be organized, to be social, our struggle also has to be organized and social because the big problem I see in Western the United States, um, uh, progressive and, um, and revolutionary organizations is subjectivism, individualism, and um, they are thinking they can fight it alone. It is not possible because um, it is not your struggle. It's not, it's not a struggle for you know, Joseph to, to win. It is, it is a struggle for all of us to win. And as Lenin will say, to start a party of the new type, you don't need uh, the masses first. You just need you know, three or four people to be clear on what they want to advance. Then 
uh, you can see the nuclear starts to grow. Um, I, I think when we opted to advance now to organize primarily as a Communist Party of Kenya, uh, in the Central Committee that started off as barely three people, now has expanded to as a national, uh, you know, a national movement. In that way, uh, my encouragement to the students and um, you know to to you particularly is that to philosophy is about debates and, and you know and and it's it's a battle of ideas and at the philosophical space I think the battle of ideas is between two ideological thoughts we have uh, metaphysics and idealism on one side and we have uh, materialism on the other side there are people who say that we can get knowledge away from science or through what whatever reason there are people who say we got ideas in art in our head or ideas drop from heaven or such crazy things but there are people from uh, uh, you know on the side of materialism that continue to advance that the philosophical um, thinking has to be you know informed by sciences and not any other even though we have been accused of scientism or uh, you know, reductionist approach, but I, I, I think we can never use, um, we can never use philosophy only to justify theology and, um, you know, and abstracts like, uh, you know, God and all that kind of thing. Right. We can use philosophy to advance, uh, you know, humanity. And as a philosophy student, I wish you well. And um, uh, I hope to see a Marx in you, the young Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, and and I'll be sure to share our writings and uh, all the best to you, comrade, and, and solidarity for the struggle in Kenya. Okay, no problem. Bye, bye, comrade. And uh, you could, if, if, are you going to publish this in a journal? You're going to transcript it? Yeah, so we're going to transcribe it and publish it. Um, we may also publish uh, and do like a podcast as well, um, and and kind of. Uh, send you the final uh, transcript before we publish it so you can look through it and see that it's uh, to your liking so we can publish it for the journal. The journal will be probably, we're still in the process of writing, collecting interviews, so probably will be published around, we do twice annually, so around June, and then there will be another in winter, so in December. Ah, okay. That's good. If you share with me also the podcast, I could be able to share it on our social media as well. Awesome. Yeah, I will do that for sure. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. How in Guinea I'm to be Matusana. Kazi zao zota wakuzi ifanya Tuki kula mfupa okula nyama Vita mbejia ile ganji wame tunya nganya Vijana wote situkona buka Vako zetu zote anazita mbuwa 22 ni endo tunacha guwa Juma shida zetu hawezi kuruka Musi white dance mawera zita kuwa Team CPK hatuna gatu pupa Tunakamsla wezi kutu chuja Hawengine watoi buka ndiyo buda